Good morning to you all. Good, morning. Good to be here with you and uh, to join together this lovely morning yeah, in worshipping our living and our glorious God. Do you think there's something for the young people? I uh, think there's some crafts, Easter crafts today. So that's something to look forward to. And uh, meanwhile, and, uh, we're going to begin the service now. We're going to sing from Psalm 146. Words on the screen there. And this is a psalm just of praise to God. So let's raise the roof, let's lift our hearts and worship God. That's it. Someone who doesn't any longer have a mom or a dad. But we use, use it usually about 
young people, children, because when you get to be old like me, it's quite normal not to have your mum and dad living any longer. But when you're young, uh, we tend to use the word orphan, meaning someone who doesn't have a mum or dad, or someone else that takes care of them and looks after them. So I want you to think for a minute. I want you to think about those people that really look after you. Those people who do anything for you, who really, really love you and take care of you. I want you to think about them for a minute. I want you to imagine if they just suddenly went away for 10 days, but you didn't know it was going to be 10 days. They just went away. How would you feel? Yes? Sad. Yeah. You'd feel sad. You'd feel sad. You'd definitely feel sad. Anything else? Yes? You'd feel worried. You'd, yeah, that's great. You, you're absolutely right. You would feel worried, which wouldn't be great. But you would feel worried. You wouldn't know, hmm, what's going to happen to me now? These people that love me and care for me have gone away. So an orphan is someone who has that experience and doesn't have the people who were caring for them, mum and dad, there anymore. But someone else will take care of them and they'll still be absolutely fine. But just think now about those who followed Jesus. Jesus had 12 closest followers when he was living in the world. People like Peter and Andrew and James and John. So if you ask Peter or Andrew and James and John, who would you least like to go away and leave you for 10 days? What would their answer be? Who do you really not want to go away for 10 days and leave you? What would they say? That's right, because they had got so used to being with Jesus and Jesus looked after them and Jesus guided them and Jesus helped them and Jesus did some very wonderful things for them, but then one day he went away and he left them. In fact, he did it in a most dramatic and frightening way. He died. He died on a cross. And that's something we think about this Easter time. He died on a cross and then he was buried. But then he rose up again, and it was great because he was alive again, and they were with him again for 40 days. But then he left them again. This time he didn't leave them by dying, he left them by rising up into heaven. And then they really were alone, Peter and Andrew and James and John and his followers. They were really left alone. And maybe they felt sad, maybe they felt worried. But Jesus had said something to them. He made a promise. A promise is a good thing to me, as long as you're going to keep it. And Jesus made a promise, and he said to them, I will not leave you like orphans. I won't leave you like orphans. I will come to you again. So when Jesus went up to heaven, they must have thought, hmm, this is a bit worrying, this is sad, but he did say he would come to us again. But they were, they were alone without him for 10 days, 10 days. And they were just waiting and wondering, how is Jesus going to come to us again? Is he going to come back down and walk about among us again? Or what's he going to do? And they were all together in a big room in the city of Jerusalem. And they were praying and asking Jesus, when are you going to come? What's going to happen? Show us, help us, guide us, lead us, care for us. We're frightened. We don't know what to do. And suddenly, oh, I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it also this. They were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled 
with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages or tongues as the Holy Spirit helped them to do. Wow! And that was Jesus coming back to them again, keeping his promise. He wasn't going to leave them uh, like children without a mum or a dad or anyone to care for them. He was not going to leave them alone just to get on with it as best he could. But he came to them after 10 days by his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit. You can't see the Holy Spirit. But he's here today and he comes to everyone who asks Jesus to come into his or her life. He comes to everyone to fill our hearts so that when we walk about in Kyle or Plockton or wherever we are, we know we've got Jesus with us by his Holy Spirit, his love and his care, like a father caring for us. We sang, I don't know if you noticed when we were singing there, he sang about how God cares for the fatherless. Well, Jesus came and didn't leave these disciples without someone to care for them. He doesn't leave us either. By his Holy Spirit, he comes and lives in us too to help us. And that is a most wonderful thing. So let's pray together for a moment to him. Jesus, we thank you that you did walk along among the people in this world for a time, and then you died for our sins. But you didn't stay dead. You rose again, but you didn't stay in this world. You rose up to heaven, but you didn't leave us alone. You sent your Holy Spirit down to us. And we thank you that today we can ask you into our hearts and lives by your Holy Spirit to guide us and care for us and help us today. We don't need to be sad and we don't need to be worried. Come to us now, we pray, and fill our hearts and help us to believe in you and trust you and help us to follow you for your sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now. We're going to sing a little chorus. Asking Jesus to open our eyes. I'm asking God to open our eyes so we can see Jesus. Okay? So, we've sung this one before. Come on. Yes, we have. <coughs> you want to come up, Heather? No, you don't want to come up to anyone else? Want to the front to give us a bit of guidance? Okay, my left here to sing. Okay. I'm going to switch this off so I don't need too much. Right, let's stop. Very simple. <coughs> Some exciting stuff waiting in the hall to do. 
So Heather is going to gallop out with you to the hall and we'll see you in a wee while when you come through for our cup of tea. Very good. Well, these kids don't look, they don't look too resentful that they're not away on holidays. So I uh, why would we want to be away on holiday when they could be here? Um, the service tonight is at half five in Kalakan, and uh, Gordon's on holiday. DJ Stewart is going to take that service. Palm, this is Palm Sunday, and uh, although I'm not thinking about that theme myself today, I think DJ will be. Uh, prayer meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we met in person last week, but we're going to go back to Zoom for a wee while. Uh, so we'll be meeting by Zoom, and Heather will send out the link during the week, and we're on study 18 in the book Gentle and Lowly. And next Sunday is Easter Sunday and there's uh, one or two extra things. First of all, we always have a service in Plockton at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, in the open air church, just a short service, maybe half an hour, and you're most welcome to come along to that as people from the area, from different churches hopefully, gather together to, uh, to worship God on the day that we remember especially that Jesus is risen from the dead. So that's 8 a.m. in Plockton. We'll be here as normal at 10.30. Uh, and then uh, we were thinking about having a lunch, but we're maybe not quite geared up in the hall yet for that. There's still <coughs> some uh, teething problems or snagging to do with the kitchen, especially. So our friends in Inverina have a service at 12, uh, and they have lunch after that service. So they have invited us up to the service, or if we can't make it in time for that, to go for lunch up in Inverina Hall. Probably about quarter past twelve, quarter past one rather, uh, next Sunday. So if you, so if you just uh, want to take a break uh, from cooking or from uh, eating at home, let's go enjoy our friends and then be in next Sunday. And then we'll be back here next Sunday evening at five thirty, and uh, we're going to look at a presentation from the organisation Christian Witness to Israel. Uh, uh, so we'll have a normal worship service, but they're, they've got a great presentation about the Passover and its meaning in a Christian context. So we'll watch uh, the uh, chief executive of Christian Witness to Israel, Joseph Steinberg, <coughs> presenting about the Passover because the students here. Uh, yeah, and just one other thing, the, I think I mentioned this in the email I sent out last week, but in fact I didn't send out an email this week, did it? Too many other things on my but anyway, we were looking uh, the other day at the church's givings over the last couple of years. Now, many churches have had a real crisis of giving uh, in the time of the pandemic, but ours hasn't. And we've pretty much kept up uh, our giving consistently. And so, from the bottom of the hearts of uh, one another, I guess, in a sense. But of the Deacon's Court as well, of the Treasurer, thank you for your continued giving to the work of the Church of Jesus Christ in Scotland and uh, to support the work here as well. We are very thankful. Now, we're going to read in the Book of Acts. Uh, again, we're going to read just what I read to the children and then go on and read from verse 1 to 37 of Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> so let's go there, Acts chapter 2. Last week I began a, a series where we were looking at the church in Jerusalem. So this is the first church, the first Christian church, and we're trying to find out about what church means, what it means to be a church. And not just like a bunch of people who meet on Sunday, but what is the church? What should the church be doing? And what should the church be about? And how should we think of ourselves in the church? And it's all there, in, mainly in the book of Acts, we'll look in other places as well. So we're going to read today in Acts chapter 2. In chapter 1 we found out that the church is built on a foundation of people. People who were not perfect by any means, but they had, perfect, they had a perfect message and a, and a great experience of Jesus to begin to share with the world. People, especially apostles. But anyway, so 10 days after Jesus rises up to heaven, uh, it's the day of Pentecost. We know that because Passover 
is when Jesus died and rose, and 50 days after Passover in the Jewish calendar comes Pentecost. Uh, so we know exactly what the times are. When the day of Pentecost came, they, that's the 12 apostles plus uh, a wider group, uh, we're told there's 120, but there's probably more than that by now, uh, meeting together in this large upper room in Jerusalem. They're all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elements, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. When Peter stood up with the eleven, sorry, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ.
others. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Well, leave it there. Come back to that again next week for the passage, but may God bless his word to us. We're going to pray again for a few moments. Let's join together in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we've just read a passage that is unlike any other passage in any book, anywhere in history or in the world. We worship you, Lord, that we are part of an extraordinary body of people by virtue of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we worship you that the Holy Spirit on earth tells us that Jesus is in heaven at your right hand. It tells us a great deal about his position and power. And we thank you today that as we come to you through the name of Jesus, his name is the name that is above every name. We come to worship you now. We come, Lord, to take everything that is in our lives that's ugly and distorted and impure and unclean and just lay it before you and ask your cleansing, your forgiveness. We want our lives, Lord, to have a right, loving, compassionate attitude towards the people around us, not only in our families, but in our neighbourhoods, where we work, eh, among the people that we socialise with, the people that we meet on the street, in the villages. Father, we want there to be no one in our life, either in the present or indeed from the past, that we would have any attitude towards that would be an attitude that would corrupt the way we look out at other people and the way we look at you. Let there be nothing in our hearts but love, nothing, Lord, but humility, nothing, Lord, but kindness and compassion. Give us wisdom. Give us knowledge, give us patience, give us understanding. Help us, Lord, to be sympathetic. Help us, Lord, to be able to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Help us, Lord, not to judge. Help us, Lord, eh, to know just how little we really know about other people and to be eh, charitable and understanding of their situations as much as we can be. Help us, Lord, to carry people to you in prayer. Help us, Lord, eh, not to be selective about this, eh, but to carry everyone eh, to you in prayer. We know, Heavenly Father, that everyone needs you. Everyone is truly orphaned in the sense of being in this world without the Heavenly Father, unless they receive you, unless they come to you and you will be a father to them. So Lord, we pray, let none of us be orphans in this world with uh, knowing there's a great father in heaven, but not being able to call him our father. Help us, Lord, to come to you through Jesus, and help us, Lord, to know that you are our father for Jesus' sake, and that you will love us with an everlasting love. We ask, Heavenly Father, uh, for our outlook to the community, we pray that you help us to take the good things that you've given us uh, from your word today and through Jesus today, and that we'll be able to find ways to uh, sow that like seed into our community, that it may grow in people's hearts and lives. We want to do good. We want to be part of the solutions to the problems, not part of the problems. We want to be part of the cure, not the disease. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to be involved wherever we can in, in ways of helping in our community. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will particularly remember in our community those who are uh, anxious or worried, especially perhaps about loved ones who are unwell. And uh, we pray for those who uh, are experiencing the, the pain of the loss just now. And Father, we're just particularly conscious, perhaps, of Ruth McVicker and her family. 
promise now, but there are many others too. But, uh, Father, we carry them in our hearts. But, Father, reach into their lives, Lord, at this time, and comfort them as only you can. Remember that large crowd that gathered yesterday for Don's funeral. And please, Lord, bless the beautiful words uh, from uh, your scriptures that were spoken there to bring help and guidance to all of our lives. We pray for the world, Lord, it's a place which is frightening in many ways. Uh, we know, Father, that there are so many um, flashpoints of uh, trouble, of war, of the ruination that evil regimes bring. Uh, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you, Lord, will just keep governing as you have been in this world to restrain the evildoer and to bring about peaceful solutions. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And we pray for peacemakers in our world today, people who can broker ceasefires and bring about reconciliation. Our loving God work in this world and help us, Lord, to care for it as well as we want to hand it on to the next generation uh, as a place that they can enjoy and uh, flourish in. So we place ourselves now in your hands. Whatever is in our hearts at this moment that we're canning, we may be rejoicing in something, then let us bring our joy to you and thank you for it. And we may be carrying burdens, let us bring those to you as well. Whatever is in our hearts, if we're ashamed, let us find your forgiveness. If we're afraid, let us find your confidence. Lord, clothe us in your strength today and forgive our sins for Jesus' sake. Now, we're going to come back to that passage in a moment, but first we're going to sing from Psalm 68. And we're going to sing this psalm of praise to God. There's a kind of hint of uh, Pentecost, or the coming of God, in verse 7 there. Um, the Lord Himself is drawing near from Zion. From Sinai, He has come to fill. <coughs> His sanctuary on Zion, so that's the picture of God. He gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, coming in his glory to the temple in Jerusalem, coming to Jerusalem. And that's what he did again as he read at Pentecost. Let's stand and sing Psalm 68.
turn with me? Can you turn with me to uh, I switched off. Can you turn with me to Acts chapter 2? And we're thinking about the Jerusalem church, what it means for us to be church, the foundations built on the apostles, but now we come to the Holy Spirit. And let's read again verse 17. So this amazing thing happens, the sound of the violent wind, the tongues of fire, the speaking in languages. And these people from all over the Mediterranean world have gathered for the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And they're, they're hearing the apostles speaking in their own languages. And it's, it's remarkably amazing. What's happening? This is what Peter says. Uh, verse 16, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. <coughs> In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Peter, standing there, they probably moved out of this big room because there's so many people gathering and into some public space. And Peter is saying, this is what it's all about. What you're hearing and seeing is the coming of the Holy Spirit who was promised by the prophet Joel. Peter is surrounded by the other apostles, the twelve, and uh, probably by the, the wider church as well. But Peter and the other eleven of the apostles, they are the foundation of the church for all time. We saw that last week. The foundation and they're the foundation because as we saw last week they have had what we call the full Jesus experience and I'm going to keep calling it that the full Jesus experience in other words they've been there from the time Jesus began his ministry right through all the miracles and all the teaching right up to the last week of his life and all the extraordinary events then his death on the cross and then they've seen him risen from the dead. They've spent 40 days uh, meeting him over that time since he rose from the dead. And now they've had these 10 days of prayer waiting for what Jesus promised, the coming of the Spirit. They've had the full Jesus experience, these people. But how do you get from these people with their experience <coughs> uh, on to what we read about in verse 41? 3,000 people being added to the church, and on through generations, how do you get from there to here today? Because there's a bit of a problem, and it's kind of summed up in a way in verse 7. These men are Galileans, these 12 apostles, they're uneducated, ordinary people. They're not a band of amazing showmen, entertainers, charismatic figures who can whip up a crowd and get people eating out of their hands. They're de definitely not that. They're not especially smart. They're not forceful. They're certainly not manipulative. They are Galileans and they're held in contempt where they're actually starting to start the church. You know, they're Galileans. These are just country bumpkins. <laughs> who are these people? They're never going to be able to start anything off in Jerusalem by the force of their personality of their argument. And their message in any case is foolishness because they're, they're coming and they're saying, look, we're, we're telling you about Jesus who died on a cross. And of course, anyone who died on a cross is, is a condemned criminal. How are you going to start a movement on that basis? Well, some people faced with that kind of dilemma then take up the sword or the gun these days and they go on a military offensive to spread their message. And, and that can work, it's worked. Uh, with at least one other major world religion in the past and it can work but that's not the approach they're going to take the church is doomed in one generation of people can have an incredible life transforming experience but the next generation is not going to go on the basis of the previous generation they've got to learn things for themselves 
Another's experience won't compel me to make a life-changing decision to follow Jesus. So despite the experience that the apostles and the woman and 120 followers of Jesus have had in being with Jesus for three years, there's no hope for the future. The church is going to die with these people. I mean, imagine these people turning up and as they try to spread the message of Jesus, let's say in a big city like Ephesus, far away from the Jewish heartland in the Greek-speaking and Greek cultural world. And they turn up in Ephesus, imagine that, and no one has even heard of Jesus. And they're all worshipping at their Greek god temples. And their heads are full of the ideas of the philosophers, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and all these guys. And the, the apostles come into Ephesus and start telling them about Jesus, whom they've never heard of, who lived a long way away and is, is, is not in the world anymore. And he uh, died on a cross. And he rose from the dead. Well, they're, they're just not going to believe it. They're going to say, well, what's that got to do with us? The church hasn't got a hope. There's absolutely no way the Christian church is going to ex expand beyond those people who actually, personally, met Jesus. It's just not going to happen. I mean, have you ever reckoned with that? Church has got no hope. It's never going to expand in any situation because we're talking about someone long ago found a way who died on a cross and we're asking people to follow how, how can we hope to make anything happen on that kind of basis unless unless the message is accompanied with power As Jesus promised, we saw before he ascended to heaven, chapter 1, verse 4, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, about which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is not thinking that his movement is doomed once he's gone. And the reason he's not thinking that is because he knows that despite the fact that the basis of his church is really a bunch of very ordinary, despised, Galilean country people, He knows that the Holy Spirit is going to give him power. And that's how the church exists today. And we need to take that on board. The existence of the church is the greatest miracle in the world today. So they're waiting in this upstairs room in Jerusalem after Jesus ascends to heaven. And uh, read that in chapter 1, verse 13. And uh, they're... they're uh, upstairs in this room in Jerusalem where they were staying and they're praying verse 14 they all join together constantly in prayer and they don't have to wait long as Jesus says in a few days they don't have to wait long and suddenly 10 days after Jesus ascends the day of Pentecost comes and he's been with them 40 days another 10 days brings us to 50 50 days after Jesus death and resurrection at Passover time we're now at Pentecost, and suddenly, verse 2, it's, just, it's totally out of the blue. Like, they're, they're expecting something to happen, but they don't really know what. And suddenly it does. Suddenly. To ensure that this doomed movement is no longer doomed, suddenly, the Holy Spirit comes. A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw it seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest in each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What's happening? 
Well, that's the question that the crowd have, especially when they're, they're hearing languages they haven't heard since they left home to come to the feast, their own home language, their own native tongues, being spoken by the apostles who'd never ever spoken those tongues. And they're asking, what, what's happening? Well, Peter begins to explain that in Acts 2.17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This is what's happening, says Peter. It's something God promised by the prophet Joel, and it's happening now. And it's happening in the last days. Now this phrase, last days, turns up from time to time in the New Testament. And it's very important. What are the last days? You sometimes hear Christians say, we're living in the last days. Meaning they think Jesus is about to return now. But that's not what it means. Because the last days start not just before Jesus returns, but they start just after Jesus left. The last days, as Peter, have started because the Holy Spirit has come. That's when the last days begin. Uh, when Jesus is risen from the dead and ascended, we're into a new age. And the Bible separates the world's time into ages. And when you move through Jesus coming and his resurrection and his ascension, you come into a new age. And it's called the last days in the Bible. And we're living in the last days right now. The last days have begun, and beginnings can't be repeated. Once something begins, you can't make it begin again. It's, it's happened, and it can't be repeated. You got that here? I don't know. I'll leave this with you, Cameron. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks very much. That's good. Good to be prepared for every eventuality. Um, so what's happened in the last days? Well, says Peter, God's poured out his spirit. Now, it's a difficult thing for us to get our heads around, uh, is thinking about the Holy Spirit and who he is. And I use the word he rather than it, because we're not talking about like something like the wind, it's like just a force. We're talking about a person. And not only that, we're not talking about um, like a ghostly person and sort of uh, just like one of us, but without body. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're really fantastic. It's not coming on. <laughs> it's not coming on. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's all right. So when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about God. We're talking about God Himself. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail just now, but just think of him in that way. He is God. <coughs> We're in a new age, the last days of God's presence in the world by his Holy Spirit. And the presence of the Spirit begins with what we're simply calls a pouring out. And there are other images that are used about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he comes to fill Sometimes he comes to baptize, sometimes he comes upon people. But whatever it is, these apostles and the church have come into a new phase of the world's history. A new medium of the Spirit, a new encounter with God, a new quality of life in the Spirit. And the Spirit is poured out on all people, and that really means all kinds of people. And so the tongues that the apostles are speaking and that the people are hearing, it says in verse 8, each of us hears in his own language, is a sign that what's happening is for people everywhere. Whether they, they speak Greek eh, or Aramaic, which is what Peter's probably speaking here, or whether they speak English or Gaelic or whatever they speak, the Holy Spirit is coming for everyone. All kinds of people. Eh, and as verse 18 says, men and women, and verse 17, young and old, uh, but not indiscriminately. It's not like suddenly the whole world is filled with the Holy Spirit, but it's to what verse 18 calls my servants, God's servants. Uh, God's Holy Spirit is coming to God's servants, men and women, young and old, of all nations and people, those who are willing to serve God 
The others watch, and there's a lot of watching going on in this episode, this, this day of Pentecost. Lots of people are watching what's going on and saying, we haven't a clue what's going on here, um, and uh, we don't want really to get too involved in this. And if that's what people are like with Jesus, then they stand aloof and they don't experience the Holy Spirit. But those who do, it says, they will prophesy, verse 17, the prophecy. Now, when Peter speaks about this, he's speaking about something that's for every Christian everywhere. So it's, it's not the special gift of prophecy or the special office of prophet here. He's speaking about something every Christian does. And it's what Peter's doing here. It's telling others about Jesus. The Holy Spirit has come to empower every Christian to speak about Jesus freely and confidently. And what's going to happen is that because of the Spirit coming, this hopelessly doomed bunch of people are suddenly going to become the foundation of a worldwide all-time movement. And we get a, a real hint of that uh, when, in verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and 3,000 were added to their number that day. Well, there's thousands more watching that don't. It's not everyone. But the Spirit works in many hearts on that day. And they become followers of Jesus. And suddenly the church is, is a really very large contingent of the population of Jerusalem, a very significant body, much bigger than the uh, Jewish leaders who had crucified Jesus and whose opposition had spelled such trouble for Jesus' followers. So the Holy Spirit has come to take Jesus to the world, beginning with the apostles and, and the others with them. And we know that because when Peter finishes his sermon in verse 36, he's not speaking about the Holy Spirit. He's not saying, folks, you really need the Holy Spirit. He's speaking about Jesus. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. The Holy Spirit has not come to shine on himself. He's come to shine on Jesus. He's come to enable us to shine on Jesus in the world. And it's because of that that the church gets going dramatically and with power. So, can you see then how the church gets going? Can you see then how the church keeps going? How we as a church can have hope for the future? It's not because we're, we're relying on people and saying, well, we've got a great future because we've got some really great people in the congregation. We've got a great future uh, if only you could say you've got a great future because you've got a great minister. Well, you know, some people do talk about it. They say, well, come and meet our minister. He's amazing. I mean, don't talk about me, but I see that in church as often. Well. That's not the future of the church. The future of the church is when everyone who calls Jesus Lord and has the Holy Spirit in them speaks about Jesus. And things happen. That is the future of the church here and everywhere. And the Holy Spirit has come so that the church can begin and spread and keep going to the end of this age, to the end of the last days. <clears throat> he comes into our lives and very briefly, and we could spend a lot of time just thinking about what he does in our lives, very briefly he gives us first that sense we're not orphans anymore. <clears throat> we have a Father in heaven. And he gives us uh, that sense of um, being equipped and prepared by God. He gives us what are called the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. And the gifts of the Spirit are special gifts for people to use to spread the message of Jesus. The Holy Spirit coming to people when they receive Jesus here at Pentecost and ever since is the difference between the church growing or just dying out. <coughs> and so you and I need to live in the power of the Spirit. 
That's how we need to live. If the church can have any future, and if the people around us are going to receive Jesus and an eternal life, we've got to live by the Spirit. So we receive the Spirit as soon as we become Christians. But what often happens when people become Christians and they receive the Spirit and they, they're, they're really aligned at that point of very fresh, what often happens is they immediately began, begin to try and restrain the work of the Spirit in their lives. So this is frightening. This is the West Coast. You know, we, we don't do the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit makes us want to speak about Jesus. We're too reserved for that. So we start putting the lid on the Holy Spirit. It's what the Bible calls grieving the Holy Spirit. You want me to tell about Jesus, we say to God, but I want to be liked. I want to fit in in my community. And so we quench the Spirit. You want me to love, we say to God. But we say, but I just want to be a private Christian. I want to have my sins forgiven. I'm very happy to pray quietly on myself and read the Bible and go to church, but I don't want to be public. And I don't want to be out there. I want private privacy. Well, that's not what the Holy Spirit does. So if we're quenching like that, this threatens the life of the church, the future of the church, when we do that. You want me to fit in with God? Eh, we say, or we want, you want me to fit in with you, God? But I want to fit in with the people around me. And we quench the Spirit, because we're going in the opposite direction to what the Spirit wants to lead us into. You want me to be generous? But I see so many things to spend my money on. You see how we quench the Spirit of it. You want me to pray? But I want to watch telly and catch up with social media. You know, all these sort of things shut down the work of the Spirit. And some as Christians who start out rightly, they, they become very, very lifeless and heavy and dead. They had power, but they shut down the power. They could have loved, they could have prayed, they could have given generously, they could have seen people coming to Jesus, but they quenched the power. And I've done that. Probably everyone here. I've seen a few hands hanging because that's sadly what we do. And that's when the church stops going. Because we can't make the church grow by the force of our personalities. We can't make the church grow just because of the, the ministry or because of, of uh, having a nice comfy place to come and be in. We can't make the church grow by that. We need the Holy Spirit to work through us. We're in the age of the Spirit and the church only ever grows anywhere by the power of the Spirit. So we need to be, instead of blocking the Holy Spirit, we need to be channels of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to leave you today, that challenge. Because God wants you to think of yourself as a believer in Jesus, to think of yourself as a channel of the Holy Spirit. And channels can get blocked. And if they're blocked, if your channels are blocked, think what blocks them. Think what's in the way. Think what's selfish. Think what's you saying, God, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, let you take me in this direction because I'm not comfortable with it. It doesn't fit with my image in the community. It doesn't fit with the people that I hang out with. Don't do that. Think of yourself as a channel. And come to God and say, well, God, I have to tell you, this is blocking the channel. And that's blocking the channel. And I'm very sorry about that. Because the blockages in the channel of the Holy Spirit flowing through my life to others are threatening the future of the church that I go to. Because if everyone is like me, with blocked up channels where the Holy Spirit should be flowing to other people through me, the church is doomed in a generation. So we need to be channels of the Holy Spirit. I mean, to look at our lives 
This is a challenge to take away with you and for me to take away too. In the week ahead, think about this. What is in me that's blocking the Holy Spirit working through me so that other people can see God's love in me? So that other people can see uh, and hear about Jesus in me and the forgiveness that Jesus offers and the peace of God that Jesus offers. What, what is there in me blocking that? And if, if you see anything at all, just take it to God and say, Well, I just don't want that anymore. Forgive me. Renew me as a channel of your Holy Spirit. And He will, because God is abundantly, abundantly merciful. He's very, 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 very patient with us. And uh, He's seen it all before in people who uh, get going well and then they, they get all called up as channels of the Spirit. Uh, and then they come to God and say they're sorry and they get going a bit and then they get all called up. <coughs> uh, we need to come to God and just start fresh in the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through us to others without any blockages of selfishness, of greed, uh, of uh, wrong priorities, of a love for money, a love for popularity, a love for reputation. We need all of that to go so that the Holy Spirit can fill us and the church can grow and beloved people outside in our community can come to Jesus and with us worship our risen Savior. Amen. Let's pray for a moment together. So Lord, we thank you for what we think about this morning. We, we pray that you will help us to be full of your Holy Spirit. If there's anything in us, Lord, that's stopping that, please take it away today, Lord. So that the church may have a future by your power of working through us and people's lives. And please, if we haven't yet received your Holy Spirit, because we haven't yet received Jesus, Lord, let this be the day. Let this be the day we ask him in and we're prepared to put away our priorities and all the things we want in order to get the better things that you want for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing as we close from the hymn, Breathe on me, Breath of God. Prayer to the Holy Spirit. To fill it with life in you. Let's let's stop.
grace and the mercy and the peace of God and Father and Son and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with each one of you now and always. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so you're welcome through to the hall now for a cup of tea. And I hope you're able to do that. Thank <laughs> you.